our last class now being recorded. And uh, thanks everyone for kind of sticking it out with this, uh, with, uh, not not too drawn out, but a lot of a lot of talking. Um, tonight's going to be a little different because Sandy is not here, um, and she has been doing all of the kind of visual aids, and um, so none of that. So it's mostly just going to be me me talking tonight, as as usual. Lots lots of information that's going to be coming fast. Um, first, though, I'd like to introduce. Um, introduce Jay Parrish, who you see on your screen. Jay is coming from San Francisco live. And he is a, um, has been a project manager for 15 plus years in the Bay Area and is currently um, developing a course, uh, an online course, which, um, and I've been helping him just a little bit, just starting to help a little bit develop that. But uh, we'll, we'll give you a reference to that at the end of the class to check out, because um, anyone who's interested in kind of going on um, with much more in-depth um, training, there are lots of great options, and Jay provides one. So with that, we'll get started. So tonight's class is on um, residential construction management. And as kind of true to most of this class, it's going to be pretty specifically oriented to San Juan County, to this, to this market, rather than um, the type of residential construction that might be going on other places in the country. Um, it's, uh, it's, I like to think it's fairly unique here just because like so many things are um, the nature of doing anything in San Juan County in the islands is 10 times more difficult than anywhere else. So uh, I think it's, it's kind of put us on another level. Um, so, and again, specific to San Juan County, but also kind of specific to my career because that's what I know about. And um, my career with Raven Hill Construction, pretty early on, it seems like I um, kind of moved towards getting projects that were involved very challenging architecture. And just because it was the most interesting type of work and I enjoyed working with architects and I enjoyed mostly enjoyed the challenge of being thrown um, some really challenging stuff. Um, you know, not, not just kind of the standard construction, but um, architects trying to kind of reinvent the wheel. So that's personally, that's, that's the market I went, went after. But um, whether, whether you're a contractor or a project manager, you kind of find that, um, kind of find which market are you trying to go after, even within this county. You know, there's the high-end uh, high custom market. Like, like I said, the uh, complex architecture, working closely with arch architects and clients, um, there's, I shouldn't say a level below that, but um, there's a kind of more standard housing. Um, and a lot of, a lot of contractors just don't want to deal with the headaches of the really complex, uh, complex stuff and really gravitate more towards more standard construction. But as you kind of move into that market here, it's much more competitive. And um, that's, that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later is just um, the impact of competition, you know, at all levels, even at kind of the highest levels. Um, you know, I had uh, a few fierce competitors for projects that I was always trying to get, and they were always right there trying to get the same projects, and you find that at every level. So, yeah, the standard housing, um, there's... Uh, also a big remodel market here and um, you know which has its own challenges for project managers managing uh, very extensive remodel projects uh, is just a whole it's just a whole different scene from um, it makes new construction look easy a lot of times um, and it's not necessarily the work of remodel it's the management part you know, if uh, 
kind of a common sentiment among a lot of contractors is that you can't budget or schedule remodel projects. And um, I really kind of developed a model where we did work to provide uh, strict budgets and time, uh, time restraints on remodel projects. And again, like with um, any kind of construction, it's all down to um, tracking updating, trying to anticipate costs and then adjusting costs as you hit reality, but um, not just letting it, not just letting it go. So the remodel market's a great, great one. It's, uh, it's been very profitable. Uh, it just has its own, um, it has its own challenges. And then uh, another market here that is not as common is the spec market. And um, it's, in a way, it's kind of the dream that you're not dealing with closely with architects or clients. You're building a home with the intention of selling it at the end. And that, of course, has its own set of challenges for, um, for project management uh, because it's, uh, it is really as crucial as any project that you're tracking a budget and the schedule because if those get away from you, there is no way you're gonna make your money back. So that is, um, it's, it's attractive when there is a uh, spec market, which in this county over the years has kind of come and gone. You have to hit it just right uh, as part of the challenge of, um, of managing those type of projects, but um, it's, it's also a good way to go. So yeah, which market to go after? It's, it's, um, it kind of depends on who you're working for if you're a project manager, but you're also gonna find with experience that you are attracted to one, uh, one market over another. So um, the next, next topic here um, is, um, Challenges of competition. Like I mentioned, it's uh, there are just so many people here in this county involved in the building trades. It's kind of it's it's really the industry here. So tons of competition. And um, in my case, I had a few contractors who were doing the same type of projects I was doing. Uh, plus, over the years, um, some big Seattle companies started moving up here. Um, and they uh, were really attracted to this market because of um, some great high-end projects, um, some um, very um, you know desirable in terms of publicity. Uh, you know, quite a few of the projects that we did ended up being published in books and magazines and. Um, you know, just kind of splashy stuff. So the Seattle, Seattle kind of high-end contractors started moving in here and they really became the big competition um, because they, they came with um, kind of pre-established management techniques based on commercial construction models that had been developed in Seattle with, you know, most, famous, most famously with Bill Gates's house. Bill Gates's house really kind of broke the mold in terms of a house that became um, managed on a commercial level. You know, not not just a contractor building a house, but um, a huge management team. So that that really kind of changed the scene in Seattle. It uh, really had a big impact on San Juan County, also. So that was that was the biggest. Um, the biggest challenge of competition for me, but it's, uh, and we'll talk a little later about the interview process and how you go head to head with competitors in, um, in, um, in the interview process. But one of, uh, in closing on that one, one of the great things I think about working here in San Juan County is that say all the contractors had really good relationship that you know for the most part we didn't pull things on other contractors to get a job you know it it over the years um 
things didn't get with a couple of minor exceptions, things didn't really get cutthroat. You know, it's um, maybe the advantage of having, you know, mostly enough work to go around, but also I think just an ethic that was developed here. And I, I keep telling people that it's important to keep that ethic going. Of, um, again, back to what I keep saying about mutual respect, about, um, you know, respecting your competition, not trying to undercut them, not trying to badmouth them. Um, well, that does happen. You just can't resist that at certain points. But um, for the most part, a great, great relationship in terms of sharing information with other contractors, too. So um, we've always uh, kind of kept that ethic. So let me check the time. Um, yeah, I'm going to keep checking the time because we have so much to cover tonight. I'm just going to want to kind of keep keep moving through this. Uh, but I want to um, throw something at Jay here, um, just in terms of what what your experience in um, your market was in San Francisco with with competition and how kind of how you dealt with that. Sure, um, in San Francisco specifically. Uh, there are a very finite amount of GCs that do the ultra high-end residential remodeling. <clears throat> the outfits that have um, solid reputations that get these jobs over and over again, you can count them on one hand, uh, uh, you know, maybe two. And <clears throat> to reiterate what you said, um, every one of those GCs knows the other GC. And uh, while the competition is fierce, uh, there's enough work to go around. And what we had happen um, a handful of times is a GC can just get too busy. They're awarded a job, they can't do it. And if you have a good relationship with them because you've been checking in and you guys go out to lunch and you problem solve or whatever together, uh, sometimes those jobs can land in your lap. Um, <clears throat> and to add to that, uh, the work in San Francisco for these high-end jobs is very profitable. And the people that are skilled enough to do it well and deliver to the expectations of the design teams and the ownership <clears throat> and the construction managers um, become multi-millionaires. That said, uh, it's also high stress, um, requires a lot of hours, uh, requires a tremendous amount of people skills and communication, uh, especially when jockeying between the field um, and some of the most powerful and successful and wealthy people in the US doing these 10 million, 15, $20 million projects. Not quite as big as Bill Gates, which was probably 100 million. <clears throat> Um, but it's a rewarding field to be in. There's certainly tremendous opportunity. It's a great way to uh, have a dynamic career, um, to meet a lot of people, and to do state-of-the-art, one-of-a-kind projects. Yeah, no, that, that's great, Jay. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, definitely a little glimpse of um, the kind of market that we always dreamed of here that you were on such a level where um, you were kind of handing jobs, jobs off to your competitors because you just had too much. Um, and we've been, we've been close to that, but uh, it, it's again, kind of going back to which market to go after. It's definitely the war, rewards of that high-end market is if you play it right, if you do it right, you can, you can, yeah, you can make some money. So um, let's see, last on my, um, my first part is just a quick review of um, the relations of the project manager to employees and staff. And again, in my case, um, 
you know, I had project managers in the office. It was kind of the office staff and then everyone out in the field. So out in the field was always a, um, a foreman on the job and uh, a number of carpenters and in some cases like staff electrician. Uh, so really important really important part of the job of a project manager is knowing how to relate, how to communicate, how to have the respect of um, everyone who's out in the field and not, you know, just show up on the job site and it's like, oh, here comes an office guy, the, the guy with nice clean shoes and no dirt. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's just, kind of part of making sure everything runs smoothly is to show up on a job site, communicate with your foreman and have them really respect what you're communicating. And especially when the pressure is on and you know, it's, not, it's not a level of like screaming at your foreman that they have to you know, get things done quicker. It's, um, you're going to be pretty much hated if you do that. So that's that's going to be kind of a non-starter. You know, it's getting it's convincing people that they really want to work with you because um, you know you're someone to be respected. You have the information, you have the knowledge. So that's that's a crucial part of um, custom home building is just that uh, communications with the rest of the company communications with the, with the contractor who you're working for, um, that's kind of a given that you're working, tending to work very closely with, uh, with kind of the senior level people in the company. All right, so moving, moving on to part two, um, how, how does a project start? Um, how does, uh, residential projects start and that's kind of always been kind of one of the most exciting part I mean building is great building is, is, is exciting finishing a project is amazing but that first phone call is always um, always interesting a call from either a client or an architect and it, in my case it was about 50 50 you know whether I get a call from a client or um, a lot of times, the architect just got the job and he's kind of calling around to contractors to see who's interested, but mostly just because they're excited about this project and they're hoping to really take it, um, take it somewhere. Um, so you get the call and, you know, if it's the, uh, whether it's the architect or the owner, you're always trying to play it cool. <laughs> you know, you're trying to, you're trying to, Definitely, you're enthusiastic and excited, but um, you're trying to get information, as much information as possible uh, right away, you know, about the, about the client, um, what, uh, first off, where are they, if they purchased a piece of land, um, if they purchased an existing house, um, trying to, you know, get just basic information to start kind of formulating a presentation plan. Um, so if it's the architect kind of see what, trying to get a scope without, you know, you don't want to blurt out like how much money do they have, which is what you really want to know, but it's not um, very appropriate to kind of blurt that out. So you're trying to get kind of hints, um, you know, what size project, um, kind of just uh, specifics. So that's that's the first contact. And then, um, you know, it's always moving straight to when can we meet? When can, can we meet in person? Uh, hopefully, um, can we meet on the site? Uh, take a look at the piece of property or the existing house. Um, but that is, you want personal contact as, as soon as possible. Um, so you can really get a feel of the client, of the architect, of the project. Um, that uh, that first contact's important, but um, in a lot of cases, you're getting a call um, to schedule an interview, and there are 
probably a couple of other contractors that are going to be interviewed and the client wants to uh, just talk to a few contractors and just get a kind of a sense of who's doing what and what's your interest level and um, again you try and move move to that um, as uh, quickly as possible and it's important to note that that that's really become a um, pretty major part of the building climate here is that custom residential there it hasn't been really a competitive bid process for quite a few years you know back in the 90s uh we were competitive bidding just about everything uh, but what was happening was that clients and architects were finding out that the good builders our prices were all the same we were using the same subcontractors the same suppliers and so why kind of why I put all these contractors through all this work when in the end their prices are about the same and why don't you just pick the builder that you really want to work with you know and, and not um, spend all that time so and that's been I mean it's been great for builders that you know I would go through an interview process and try to um, really convince the clients that uh, my company was the one that they wanted to work with and with the understanding that we would start um, we would start working on budget like as soon as possible even um, even with an early set of plans um, but yeah so the hope is that um, you really nail you really nail that interview process and rather than you know putting a ton of work into a competitive bid you do your best at um, selling your company and what you can provide and um, and that's that's the great next call is when you get that call from the client or architect saying that um, that we've decided that we want to work with you and that that's great news always great news and uh, but it's just the start of that really starts all the work where um you really have to kind of prove to the clients that they've made the right choice and um, that's where project management really clicks into high gear you know probably the the contractor um with the project manager or uh, principal of the company has been involved in the interview process and then everything is thrown on the, the project manager to start you know really um, look at the plan and start start putting together uh, preliminary numbers um, which will be the really kind of the next the next section that, uh, the next section we're going to talk about but um, but yeah, it's interviews are um, they're tricky. You have to really exude confidence. You have to be really excited about the project. Um, the if the client is is conducting an interview, they're kind of analyzing every word you're saying. <laughs> it gets it gets pretty intense. That you have to. Um, you know, it's best to be really relaxed and, um, but um, you can tell there are times that you might say something a little bit off and the client kind of picks up on that and might make assumptions based on that. So it's, there's a ton of subtleties. So you could probably write a book on the psychology of, uh, of kind of what a client is thinking at any phase of the project. But, um, but at the same time, yeah, you're trying to get a read on the client. You're trying to get a sense of what they're going to be like to work with. Um, you know, what are their concerns? Um, or, or is their main concern strictly budget? Is it strictly schedule? Do they have a really tight schedule that they need to um, comply with? Hard to say, um, but you're trying to get a read on the client. Then of course, what happens is as soon as the interview process is over, uh, you do the Google search on <laughs> just who the clients are and try and get try and get the scoop on um, you know every everything you can find out. Even though you're definitely trying to be cool about it and not uh, 
um, you know, not let let them know that they're doing it. But you want to you want to get much more extensive background information about who you're talking to, and that gets pretty interesting at times. Um, pretty interesting people we work with. Uh, one client I found out after talking to him, I think three times, I finally Google searched him and found out that she'd been an astronaut, you know, kind of a famous astronaut, you know, just things like that is, uh, is keeps it keeps it interesting. Um, let's see, where are we? Um, yeah, of course, we have to talk a little bit about um, competitive bidding, because it's, it's, so, you know, like, like I've said, I, I was able to kind of move into a market where I got jobs based on the interview process where we put together tight budgets and track those budgets. But um, the competitive bidding is still a huge part of the industry where you're um, putting together a price to do a project, presenting that price as kind of a big number and a client is comparing it with contractors who are doing the same thing. And, you know, it's just a lot of times in the end, um, you hope that they're not just going to pick the lowest bid, which many times they say they're not. But when the prices come in and they're gigantic and way above what they thought, in the end, they're picking the lowest price just because they feel they have to. So that's, um, yeah, it's hard to avoid the competitive bidding process, especially a project that you really want and you decide that it's worth, um, it's worth kind of the investment. Um, well, for the contractor, it's worth the investment of paying a project manager to put together, put together prices. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a call, but it's a reality. Um, so yeah, the last part of this uh, last part of this session is called the emotional letdown of not getting the job, and that you know this one is actually really big. Um, you know the construction industry. You know Jay kind of mentioned a little bit that um, it can eat you up. There's there's highs and lows. I always said it can be kind of a meat grinder. Um, emotionally, that especially if you're um, passionate about what you're doing, if you're passionate about building, you get tied up emotionally in a project before it ever starts. You know, some uh, project that you really want, um, no matter how much you try and protect yourself, it can be a huge letdown to not get the project. And, um, you know, you have to be, you definitely have to be aware of that. Um, the last project manager that I had before I sold my company, who was really good. He was he had just tons of experience, really good, but he got kind of eaten up by the emotional uh, letdown part of it and just the, the frustrations, you know, the, the frustrations of um, things not working out the way all the best laid plans, as they say. Um, yeah, you have to find ways. Um, I always tried to just laugh at everything to survive but, and kind of made it more enjoyable. But um, again, at the end of this one, I'll uh, maybe throw this back to you again, Jay, for a second, just about your experiences with kind of the emotional, um, how you cope. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, for sure, in construction, you wake up in the morning early, sometimes it's still dark out, and you have a plan for what you're going to do with your day. Uh, and you thought about it before you went to sleep. And uh, as soon as you walk out the door, the phone rings, and there's a problem. And then there's another problem. And then somebody didn't show up. And then there's a change. Uh, and you know, by the time it's 4:45 or five o'clock, you've put out all the fires that you had to deal with that day, uh, and then you can start focusing on your what you needed to do and what you wanted to do uh, at seven o'clock. So uh, I think 
kind of the key takeaway as far as surviving the choppy waters of construction is that you have to be okay with changes. And if you can't deal with that or you're, you struggle with changes or just find them too frustrating, I think this career in this line of work is, is going to be too challenging. Um, there are changes all the time and they come from the design team, they come from the owners, they come from subcontractors, they come from unforeseen uh, conditions, um, they come from mistakes, they come from delays. Uh, sometimes they come from successes, things get done quicker than you had anticipated and all of a sudden your long lead item isn't there. You know, you have to be able to jockey those changes and you have to do it uh, without holding on too tight. Uh, and if you can do that, I think that that, you know, eliminates at least half of the frustrations that you encounter. And then you can just focus your time and energy on, uh, you know, other things that come up during the day. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, it's just having having an attitude that, um, that it's good to have an attitude that you feel a sense of accomplishment from, you um, surviving a challenge from you know kind of figuring out how to deal with a challenge or a mistake or a problem and you you uh you get over that and it's just it's kind of like building you get a sense of accomplishment that okay we got through that that's great you know i always um kind of you know, we always had a policy of when a mistake was made, you found a solution that made it better. Like, um, you know, you found a solution that made it seem like it was planned all along. And um, and then, of course, it's uh, getting to a point where your management is so tight that you just don't have problems, which almost never happens. But um, it's, yeah, attitude. Um, towards how to deal with frustrations, crucial, crucial part. We just can't uh, stress that enough, that, um, the emotional, emotional part. And then, you know, you're also, even, even if everything's just clicking along great, a lot of times you're dealing with the emotions of the client who it's in a lot of cases, is the biggest thing they've ever done. And money is just, is pouring out like an open tap, you know, it's just, um, and, like I had said in a previous class, a lot of times the client sees a construction project as just barely controlled chaos. And you're trying to present to them that is not really everything's going great. But um, yeah, clients, clients can get emotional. And um, so exuding confidence, um, just keeping things fun, whatever that takes is a crucial part. Okay, moving on. Um, next section. Again, this this uh, section is um, a little bit unique to this market and kind of my experience. And I think I had talked about it a little bit before in in budget, but it's kind of part of the um, getting hired for the job, meeting the architect and client. Uh, there are many many times that I got the job because um, I had a good track record with the architect of working with them at a very early stage of the design process. And um, it seems like clients really like that. You know, they really were excited about that option of having a contractor on board very early on as um, design was being developed. And, um, you know, the big reason kind of the classic architect comes up with a glorious plan. It just fulfills all the client's dreams, everything they wanted. It looks really cool. And then they get prices from a contractor and it just blows it out of the water in terms of the expectations for cost. So the um, reality of working on budget very early on is to kind of keep design on track budget-wise. So ideally by the time the um, plans are fully developed, fully fleshed out, uh, you have a budget 
pretty complete budget. Um, and before the construction contract is even signed, um, you worked out, you really worked out cost. Uh, and that can be, can be tough because clients are kind of facing the, um, some tough realities of uh, what, what budget's really gonna be before they ever see something um, solid. So um, that has, like I say, been very, very successful. Um, the challenge, again, the challenge is, is that you're at all levels of construction, you're dealing with huge numbers, huge dollar figures. Uh, it's pretty rare to um, start a project and a client says, that's just exactly what I thought it was going to cost. That um, is pretty, pretty rare. There's kind of unrealistic expectation, um, unrealistic expectations. Um, so yeah, that's, that's big. Um, so, and we, to a certain extent, we kind of call it cost engineering. You know, it's not just, it's not just um, that as a project manager, you're, you have like a big cash register and you're just ringing up prices as uh, bids and material prices come in. You're always kind of in the back of your mind, you're always thinking of alternates. You're always, as you get a price, you're kind of comparing it to what your expectations were. You're, you're kind of starting to think creatively in terms of what, you know, is there something we can do to change this and bring this price back, this cost in line? Um, so cost engineering is kind of a big, broad basket, but it's, it's a big part of project management, especially in these um, high-end um, high projects that, and it's, it's, it can be delicate. It can be del delicate with an architect who has, you know, kind of specific ideas and you're kind of gently telling them that you've got a great idea that is not going to, um, compromise their architectural intent. So, I, and I can say again, I, I think my company was really successful with that, um, with having a, kind of a design ethic that was tailored to the different architects we worked with. You know, I kind of got a sense of what they were interested in, kind of the subtleties of, um, creative intent um, and so that when you came up with ideas that were going to save cost they really fit in with the, the design criteria and that you know that's something that's hard to teach you know it's really um, something that I developed over years but it's just important to, to note that that if you're becoming a part of the architectural process it's not just as reality check with cost it's becoming part of the team you know it's uh and i think that's why i really enjoy the relationships i had with a number of architects is is they kind of grew to respect my um ideas and um and everyone looks good when the budget um kind of comes in line when the architect gets the gets the house that they want, when the clients get the house they want, and you kind of orchestrated everything to to come in line with um, with cost. This cost engineering, it's uh, it's quite a process. Um, and so, yeah, how to get these tools? To, how to how to use these tools to get the job? Um, I kind of I think I kind of mentioned that, that, that there are a lot of jobs we got with having, without having to go through a huge competitive process, just based on our track record um, with, um, with doing that. But yeah, again, to, to throw something back to you, Jay, did you, um, especially when you were doing residential construction, was that, was that something that that you guys did work with 
um, cost development at early stages of the of the project? Because I've never been sure whether that was kind of standard in other areas or. Sure, um, I would say we, we definitely did. And sometimes we would meet an architect or we would meet an owner and we would be uh, generating estimates from very early on back of the napkin schematic type drawings, uh, maybe a floor plan, maybe not. <clears throat> and that really, I think is what you want to shoot for. Um, like you said, it just, it develops a relationship. You become part of the team, you're, uh, delivering invaluable information. Um, and it, 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 it does two things at once. You, not only are you able to contribute and deliver value, uh, over and over again, um, which definitely helps you uh, solidify yourself uh, to being awarded that job. Um, <clears throat> but it also makes it politically uncomfortable for the homeowner to then go choose somebody else. Uh, and we've found that, um, <clears throat> you know, when we do a lot of pre-construction and estimating and help them develop scope and develop budget, uh, you know, they, uh, unless they're just unsavory people and they just gobble up a whole bunch of your time and bail last minute and go to somebody else, you know, maybe that's a blessing. That's somebody you didn't want to work with anyway. Um, but it, it really does help solidify uh, your position and it just keeps things more transparent and more, more honest. Uh, and I would say, you know, the majority of times when we did put all that effort forward, uh, we were awarded the job. And if we didn't want to take the job, it was our choice and not the, the, the owners. Um, and it, it really is the way to go because with the competitive bid situation, it's, the, the, it's a wild process and that there's no predictability on outcome. And you, even if your number is low, you might not get it. If it's high, you might get it. You know, you really want to be in the middle. Um, but it's a ton of effort. And we talked about this the other day when the majority of times when we are in a competitive bid situation, the owner had already chosen who they wanted to work with. And they just had, you know, two or three other GCs do a full blown estimate for them so they could you know, have a gut check on the number from the guy that they wanted to work with. So to circle back, yes, um, we did a negotiated work. That's really the way to do it. Uh, we also did competitive bidding, um, but the out, you know, sometimes we would get it, sometimes we, we wouldn't. And uh, that's, it's a lot of work to develop um, big estimates like that and um, sort of You just got muted, Jay. Sorry, I was trying to let somebody in and uh, accidentally <laughs> clicked the wrong button. Am I back? <laughs> You're Sorry back. about that. Okay. It was not perfect, uh, we promise. So certainly, um, you know, competitive <clears throat> bidding is a reality of life. You're gonna have to do it. But if you can establish good uh, relationships with architecture firms, and if you can also just get to know the types of people that are doing these jobs, uh, that I think that that's really the recipe for success. Yeah, yeah, good, good points. Um, yeah, just uh, kind of segueing into uh, talking about contracts. Um, it, when we could, we would enter into kind of a pre-construction con uh, contract with a homeowner. Um, and it was usually pretty pretty lightweight, but it was just um, kind of an agreement that we were um, providing pre-construction services to um, to develop the budget along with working with the architect, and really with the understanding that there was no commitment to um, the construction contract until we had made the budget work. And again, that's something that clients really appreciated that 
when they said you're hired, it didn't mean that we were um, given 100% commitment to actually building the project. We had to perform um, and it, kind of a test, kind of a pre-construction test, working, uh, working with the uh, clients and the architects to um, kind of establish budget as the design was being worked out. Um, at the end of that process, then we can enter into um, a construction contract. And, um, but again, no, um, no absolute commitments. And usually during that uh, pre-construction process, the pre-construction contract, we didn't charge much, um, if at all. It was it was kind of variable because um, you kind of you kind of want to play it cool. You don't want to hit the the client right off the bat. Um, you're kind of making an investment in um, getting the job, but at least it's not like a competitive. Uh, a competitive bid type investment, which you know can can be can be expensive. So, so yeah, moving into contracts, um, you know, kind of kind of what it's all about is getting that signed contract from a client to get going. To um, it's always it got to seem like half the two thirds, half two thirds of the work was just getting to that day where you have a signed contract and you can go start building something, start having fun. Um, you know, a ton of work to get to that point. Um, so the contract signing was uh, just like, oh, the be just the best, best thing to get to that point, such a sense of accomplishment. But um, yeah, just talking about different different types. Um, there are different forms of contracts, and I'm probably not the best one to talk about this one because I was always pretty lazy and just used um, a standard American Institute of Architects contract form. And they have a number of different types of contract forms that you can buy online, and they're very complete. Uh, they have um, a whole section of um, conditions of the contract that is just nothing but boilerplate. Um, that's like a small book. Um, but yeah, different. It, yeah, there are different different type of contracts. There are um, builders associations that have contract forms that are more kind of designed for builders. And I, I really can't say why I never used those. I just got used to the American Institute of Architect contracts. Um, so different types, there's, um, there is a fixed bid contract form that they provide, which is, um, you know, really just gets to the big number. You're signing, con you're signing a contract for the big number that, um, is the maximum, you know, guaranteed maximum of what uh, is going to be charged for the project. And then on a monthly basis, you're just billing draws against that total amount based on the progress um, that you made each month. And again, I, you know, it's been a number of years since my company um, did that type of contract. It kind of it kind of morphed into a type of contract that was called cost of work plus a guarantee, uh, cost of work plus a guaranteed maximum, which was kind of the classic time material. You're just you're just billing time materials, actual cost of what the project is costing, plus your contractor's fee. Um, added on to that, but you're providing a guaranteed max that the project is not going to exceed a certain amount. So it's kind of like a fixed bid, but it's one that you're tracking. Um, you're billing at cost, and at times if the project's gone over cost, then um, at the end of the project, you're going to be in a tight spot financially because you're going to come up with money that is not um, being paid out because you've agreed to a, a guaranteed max. 
So it wasn't that crazy about those, but the competitive market a lot of times demanded that. So um, eventually the last 10, 15 years, all of our contracts were American Institute of Architects uh, cost plus contract, which is basically as simple as we send you a bill and you pay the bill. And, uh, but, you know, with, with conditions to that, um, which we'll, we'll get into uh, below here a little bit. Um, then the other type of contract, the dreaded, the absolute dreaded worst kind of contract is the one that the owner's lawyers have written. And I don't think I ever actually signed one of those because they get so insane um, it's, it's kind of unbelievable. If you hire an architect to write a client for you, there is there no end to how much they're going to protect their client. So um, it's, it's kind of a non-starter. Um, I think in, in my career, I just had a couple of times that an owner decided that they wanted their lawyers to, to write, write their own contract. And they were so ridiculous that... Um, it was kind of a joke. <laughs> uh, so let's see, before I continue on, I, at this point, I'm going to ask you, Jay, um, you know, since, like I said, I'm probably not the best one, but what, what types of contracts did, um, did your company um, work with? Same as you, is that standard AIA form, uh, cost, oh, right? plus a, cost plus a fee. Um, they're great. Uh, you know, there's everything that you need there. They're fair. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with them. Um, yeah. We would get into situations where we would use an AIA uh, contract and then it would go to a homeowner's lawyer and then the lawyer would just redline it all over the place and, you know, add liquidated damages and, you know, all sorts of, uh, you know, clauses about contingency and, just a whole bunch of unsavory stuff. And, you know, then that would have to go back to our lawyer and then they would do the lawyer back and forth, you know, it'd be 5,000 bucks, you know, just to almost get back to some version of the original AIA contract. But uh, to, to answer your question, yeah, we 99.9% we .9 of the time just use the standard AIA cost plus fee. Yeah, okay, that's good to hear because I was never, you know, I, I for a while I was using, um, uh, Associated Builders Association um, contracts, and they were good, but um, the AIA just, they're so comprehensive, and um, they have, um, you know, really good sections about conflict resolution, um, just, yeah, really complete, and, um, you know, being, there are disadvantages, because, of course, they're written by um, the Architects Association, so they tend to kind of skew um, advantages to the architect, um, and but but nothing that that big. Um, so yeah, that's a you know it's it's a great place to start. I I wish that I had um, was able to present. You know maybe we can dig one out. But if you go to the American Institute of Architects website um, to their um, online contract section, you can you can take a look at a lot of contracts. Um, so parts of the contract, of course, the contract form signed um, was a big part of it, but then there was a lot of attachments that became contract documents. And of course, the budget breakdown, um, the budget breakdown that I showed you guys, the um, first or second class, uh, that is listed specifically as a contract document that the budget um, you know, even if it's an estimated budget, it becomes um, a contract document because it's kind of what you're tracking. It's the basis of, even though it's not a fixed bid, you're um, tracking against that document. So it's uh, so it's really important to have that part of the um, part of the contract that's schedule, even if it's a draft schedule. Um, it's something that can be referred back to later if there are problems um, at some point. 
Um, you refer back to all these documents. And then, um, of course, part of the package is just copies of insurance, um, insurance policy, bond, contractor's license. Um, there's some the Washington State lien um, information documents that have to be included um, with contracts. So the whole thing makes up a, you know, a, a thick package. Um, there's, I mentioned before, there's the whole conditions section that is just boilerplate. Um, but it's, it's important to note that the hope of the contract is it gets filed and no one ever looks at it. And I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, that was the case. This, this contract got signed and stuck away and um, no reason to ever check back. Uh, because as I say, last line, all contracts have to be based on trust. It's, um, you can't, it, it's not a big enough of a legal blanket protection that is ever gonna protect you from a contentious client. <clears throat> As, as we all know with the um, legal profession is uh, they, they just love construction lawsuits because they can go on and on and on and lawyers can make tons of money. And um, so yeah, a contract has to be um, when you sign it and hope that it gets put away, it's because the client really trusts that um, you're looking out for their interests. You know, everything you're doing, you're working for your client, your um, reality may be that you're working for yourself and you're hoping to make some money, but um, really your client is, um, you're working for them, you're protecting them, you're, uh, you're fulfilling their dream and um, everything you do and communicate has to reflect that. So that's, yeah, can't, um, <clears throat> can't downplay that, that one, that, um, yeah, trust between every, I think we talked about that, just every, everyone involved on the team, you know, we, uh, we talked about that when we talked about the team, it has to be mutual respect, mutual trust, uh, and what it takes to get that is what project management is all about. <laughs> Successful project man management is, uh, is, yeah, all about having a smooth project. All right, moving on. Um, yeah, managing subcontractors and suppliers. So um, I mentioned kind of, yeah, a big part of a project manager is working with um, working with the contractor's staff, the foreman, um, but working with subcontractors can be one of the biggest challenges of, um, hopefully not, hopefully it's a great relationships and subs are great and they're doing their job and they're happy. And um, most of the time they're really happy when they're looking at the job and trying to get the job. And then when they show up on the job site, they're usually kind of pissed off about something, you know, so that is just, is just kind of the way it is, is um, it's just kind of that, that job site dynamic of um, no matter how much you work with a subcontractor, they, they want to let you know something that they're not happy with just to kind of stomp out their territory or something. So it's, it's part of the psychological game of, um, of working with your subcontractors, keeping them happy, um, convincing them that they really have nothing to be upset about, everything's good. You're gonna do everything you can to accommodate them. And no one in, on the job site is more important than they are. Even though there might be five subcontractors that you're dealing with, it's, uh, no, I kind of laugh because it, it um, yeah, it, it gets pretty funny. And in some cases, it's just kind of a game, but um, there are times when new project managers get all like all upset because some subcontractors mad at them and trying to tell them that 
they really don't have the experience they need to be doing what they're doing. And you just have to take that one with a grain of salt. And um, it's just all pushing to get things done and get everyone to do their job. Um, but a lot of it goes back to what we talked about in budget. Who, who are your subcontractors? Did you, did you pick the cheap one, cheapest person or did you um, pick a subcontractor that you work with a lot, that you trust, that you know is gonna be doing good work? Um, that hopefully the budget allows um, that you can work with the people you wanna work with. And especially now with everyone being so busy uh, is crucial for my um, ex company that uh, they're using subcontractors that we've worked with for years that we trust and uh, we get priority. Like being able to call a plumber and get them to um, give you absolute priority over everyone else, that is, um, uh, you've got to take that one to the bank. That's, that's worth a lot. Anyone who's tried to get a plumber to their house knows that, um, how challenging that is, but that's with, with all the trades. Um, if you have subcontractors that you work with that um, know that your jobs are going to be organized and well run and um, they're going to get what they need to um, be profitable, then you need to uh, really foster that relationship. So, and again, back to, back to the old thing, respect and trust, respect and trust. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's important. Um, <clears throat> see, next section I have is, uh, this is a big one, quality control. Um, that is, well, I keep saying all these subjects are big subjects, but quality control is such a big one. You know, what is the standard of quality that you're working towards and what determines that standard of quality? Um, in a lot of cases, it's what your reputation is based on is a level of quality you maintain. And that is huge. You know, that's, um, it takes constant, constant work to um, maintain a high level of quality. Um, certain times quality is determined by budget. You know, you just cannot, you can't go to the 10th degree if the budget doesn't allow it. And it becomes tricky because the client doesn't want to hear that you've cut quality because they can't afford it. You know, how do you express that? Is uh, no one's going to be happy hearing that. Um, what, what are your competitors? Um, what is their you know, quality standard? That's, that's a big one. Um, yeah, what's the standard of, uh, in some cases, uh, a client is, I'd say in most cases, a client is gonna perfect, is gonna expect nothing short of perfection. Um, if it's not 100% perfect, it's gonna show up on a punch list. And um, so you try and anticipate that level of, say, perfection, but um, it's just, I have to describe just really tight, tight work, tight quality work um, is, yeah, it, it, it's an intangible that you kind of have to define with, with experience. Um, but again, something I wanted to, um, yeah, throw to you, Jay, is, you know, we had talked about that whole thing of you can't take it to 90%, you know, just uh, that's, that's something you would come up with. Oh, that 90% um, complete is not complete? Yeah, <laughs> and a lot of people think it's complete. Yeah, I mean... Um... Certainly, it goes. Uh, you know, this is this is tricky because um, I think it it a large part of it is generated by 
experience and knowing what's acceptable and what's not as far as quality goes. You know, certainly if a scope of work is incomplete, it has to be complete. But as far as achieving um, that level of perfection, uh, it can be pretty difficult. Um, one thing, you know, subs know what's right and what's not right. So, you know, if we're on a $3 million job, let's say, and the sub does something that looks bad uh, and you pull them aside, you know, I would say, you know, this $3 million job, does that look like 3 million bucks right there? And, you know, they would say, no, it doesn't. And they have to fit, you know, they'll fix it. Uh, but, you know, juggling a homeowner's expectation, especially at the end of the job, um, when you're getting very close to having used up uh, your entire budget. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, sometimes you just have to get it done the way that they want to. Or if you really feel that it's acceptable in your heart of hearts and that their expectations are unrealistic or the budget doesn't allow it, allow for it, you can have the conversation with them and say, you know, this is what the budget has allowed. You know, this is um, an industry standard, the way that it looks. Uh, and if it's not good enough, and if we need to rework this and take it another level, um, you know, would you be on board uh, to adding um, to the budget to enable us to do that? And, uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes they'll just let it go or sometimes they'll say, yeah, it is Im important enough, you know, for us um, to really have it look a certain way, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pay to go the extra mile or, you know, maybe we split the cost to go the extra mile. Um, I, I found where there's a lot of variation, especially in high-end jobs with expectations, it has to do with, with painting. And this is also where there were wild swings in the initial estimates um, where we could have $150,000, um, you know, interior paint budget <clears throat> or a $375,000 interior paint budget. And uh, they made it, you know, the, the, those painters did different quality of work. Uh, and what we found to really <clears throat> be worthwhile is um, we would try to take, and if we were going over the budget and presenting this to the homeowner and you know they were showing that there's this wild swing in the painting budgets, we would take them to a $375,000 interior paint job and show them what that looks like. And we would take them to a $90,000 paint job and show them what that looks like. Um, <clears throat> and you know, some people say, you know, it's, if it's painted, it's painted. Other people would say, you know, I want the, I want the premium paint job uh, and they would pay for it. But um, it was kind of, kind of a digression, but uh, <clears throat> it's, it, I think that if you can think that way strategically, as far as what the expectation is going to be for the outcome, and if you can get ahead of it uh, and have those types of discussions early on, um, then you're positioning yourself for more pr predictability in the outcome. Did, did yeah. you have a similar thing with, with painting? Oh, I saw you so nodding your head a little bit. <laughs> it's so yeah, painting is so appropriate because um, most of the time, um, you know, I was lucky enough to have just a great painter, you know, a plug for Terry Ogle. Yay, Terry Ogle. Um, Anyway, great painter, but every time I presented the painting budget to a client, they just freaked out. It's like, that's just what, you know, I just couldn't imagine that um, painting could cost so much, but you just try and express that a good quality paint job is super time consuming. You know, it's not just blasting, you know, get a paint sprayer and blast everything. It's, uh, it is really an indicator of quality. Um, and, you know, kind of, kind of a big part of uh, indicators of quality is that, um, you know, what is going to be the appraised value of the house when it's done? You know, it's, um, I'm kind of proud to say that all the houses I built always got really good appraisals when they were done because of a lot of kind of subtle quality indicators and paintings, painting is a big one. So it's, it's not, no, it's totally appropriate to mention, mention that. 
Um, and then something else you mentioned, Jay, that is a big, big subject is um, industry standard. You know, what is the industry standard for everything? You know, from plumbing to painting to cabinet work, um, it, it's, you can't, as far as I know, you can't find it in a big book anywhere that is going to have one standard. There's just kind of a, kind of an understanding of, um, you know, what minimal standards are and what exceptional standards are, but it's something that's used quite a bit. You know, what is the industry standard for this? And it can change from market to market. It might be different in Iowa than it is on San Juan Island. In fact, I can guarantee it is, but um, yeah. Anyway, we're getting, getting tight here. So moving on to um, project manager, managing subcontractor safety is, hey, I keep saying this is a big one. Safety is, um, you know, I think we had mentioned before the contractor, the construction company is responsible for the safety of everyone on a job site. Um, and um, subcontractors are responsible for the safety of their employees, but the contractor has an overall blanket of safety responsibility that, um, and you know, a project manager needs to be aware of that. Um, and a lot of times the, the project manager is putting together safety books. Um, every job site has to have a safety book on, um, on the site legally so that if labor and in industries ever shows up, you hand them your safety book um, and it should be pretty complete. And then part of the uh, requirement also is to have a monthly, I don't, I don't remember, monthly safety meetings where you kind of stop all work and everyone um, drinks their coffee and listens to a little safety lecture on some subject. And so the project manager was kind of putting together those, those lessons. And, um, but yeah, that, um, blanket of safety responsibility kind of just runs through everything we're talking about. Um, it's um, not just because you don't want anyone hurt, but financially it really pays that um, my company had a great safety record. And so we every year got big refunds from um, the money we had paid into labor and labor and industries. Um, with the retro programs in Washington State, we would get a big fat check back, which was really nice because we had a great safety record. Um, and uh, part of that, I mean, just to digress a little bit, if someone did get hurt, got a sliver, got a strained finger, or let's see, someone who was just in the office with the with something, but rather than having them go on L and I disability, we would have them come in the office and or the shop and sharpen chisels for you know three days, or you know just do organize, you know organize stuff on the shelves, you know keep them working um, because it ended up um, costing way less than hurting your safety record, you know, it's just uh, if someone needs to come in the office because of a strain, something, keep them, keep them working on light duty stuff and our um, insurance adjusters really like that. Okay, so that's safety um, getting through to the end. Uh, um, yeah, the end of the end of the project, the end of everything is your guarantee of work. And I think, you know, in Washington State, there's a standard for one, one year, um, you're responsible to fix things as they break, kind of as a simple way to put it. Um, it's good policy to extend that, you know, in a lot of cases, I would come back five years later and fix something. But um, hopefully, I saw that. <laughs> hopefully, um, you really don't have many callbacks because the quality of your work is so good. I mean, there's always stuff like a doorknob that needs adjusting or 
something tweaking, but um, it's important to provide a comprehensive um, guarantee, warranty of work, um, you know, that um, it can get ridiculous. I got a call 20 years later once about, anyway, I, I, I've got lots of stories that I want to digress into, but that was a good, I think it was 25 years later, I had someone call to see if I could come fix something. Um, and I did, you know, it was kind of fun to see, to see something that, uh, yeah, and wow, 647, I think, I think I'm kind of talked out. Um, Jay, do you have any last, last comments you want to make or? Sure. Um, as far as project closeout, uh, one thing that we started doing, which really uh, went the distance with the homeowners and um, what they really appreciated, is that at the end of the job, we would turn over a uh, home manual. And that manual would have uh, subcontractors warranties in it, it would have manufacturers warranties in it. It would have a list of our subcontractors and their contact information. Um, and, you know, these these ho houses now are getting very complicated. Uh, and it definitely provided a lot of value to, uh, you know, go throughout the job and take photographs of where the water shutoff is, where the gas shutoff is, where the main electrical panel and disconnect is, where the sub panels are, where the clean outs for all the plumbing are, you know, where the hose vids are. Um, you know, anything that you can think of that might be useful to a homeowner. Also, we would include information uh, for basic maintenance that the homeowners would have to do. So when to clean out your gutters, when to get your windows cleaned and have the paint checked on the windows, mm -hmm. uh, when to clean out, you know, the booster fan for the laundry uh, vent, when to change the filters on the forced air system. Um, you know, when could they expect to change their filters on their water filtration, filtration system? You know, these things don't, they, they can get really complicated. God knows I put together manuals that took me, you know, weeks to, to do and put together a whole bunch of information. But even if you do a simple one uh, and you turn over meaningful information to them, that really goes the distance. It's something that they probably didn't expect. It'll be useful for them. It might save you a couple phone calls having, you know, to go back over there and do something. They can just figure it out themselves. Um, and it's just an, a, another, you know, nice gesture that you can you can do at the end of the end of the job. Yeah, no, that's a good point. We we did the same thing, put together a comprehensive manual to give to the owners with all the contacts and phone numbers and manuals. And anyway, um, yeah. Before we go to questions, um, I just want to give Jay a plug on his um, online for anyone that kind of wants to keep going with this. Um, this has been definitely a pretty quick, um, a pretty quick overview of uh, project management. Jay has an online course that is very comprehensive. And um, the website is buildingfutures.co. And I think we're going to send out, I think Mickey's going to send out some, um, some references to, you know, not, not just Jay's site, but um, some other online, you know, options for anyone that kind of wants to continue. You know, you've gotten a good kind of quick overview, but it's uh, been a lot of me and Sandy talking. Um, so, you know, getting a chance to look at more specific material. You know, I know Jay, Jay's site is really great. Uh, buildingfutures.co. There you go. There's your right. plug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, so moving on. Any any questions or uh, comments or anything before we before we close this out? Hey, thanks everyone for for sticking with us through all these classes. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed working with Sandy. Um, she's a great resource. Um, just, uh, yeah, I can't say it enough how, how much of a force uh, Sandy Bishop is on Lopez Island with the uh, Lopez Community Land Trust.